This episode is part two of a great interview with the creators of Molin Memory, Alex Molin and Kathy Chen. For the introduction about them, their organization, and basic tips for creating memory policies, please go back and listen to the first part of this series. This episode will cover some of the more advanced techniques. I hope you will enjoy this interview as much as I did. Welcome to the Medical Menemist Podcast, your source for memory techniques and accelerated learning in higher education. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. For the remainder of this show, I was wondering if maybe we could go over some more advanced topics, if you're all right with that. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So maybe I can give some examples of roadblocks I've run into still being relatively new to memory training, memory palaces, and you could give your expert advice on ways to correct that or prevent those roadblocks from occurring in other students trying to learn these techniques. One of them that I've come across is making the memory palaces too dense. For instance, I would try to use my childhood bedroom, putting different visual aids on every single shelf and cabinet and corner to the point that it gets a little bit cluttered and difficult to remember properly. And also probably making too many visuals, as you mentioned, was an issue. But what would you suggest for some kind of density problem in creating a memory palace? So... I had that same problem too. And I think part of that was my initial fear that I would run out of space, you know? And so I'm like, I'm just going to pack it all in the same place because I already know that this is where I'm memorizing pancreatitis. I'm going to put it all together. So I think there's two ways I changed my thinking that really helped me with this problem. Number one is to realize that I'm never going to run out of space. Like there are so many palaces out there and they don't actually have to be in the same physical space in the real world. I can just kind of link them in my mind and it becomes very organic. So for example, you know, (laughs) I remember memorizing all of my like CNS um, information in different places. I memorized some in Alex's apartment in college, some at his childhood home, but in my mind now they're very linked. So for me, that really expands the space that I can memorize things. I don't feel like I have to cram it. And then the second kind of check for myself to make sure I'm not over cramming is I try to only place information at loci in the room that I know I can see out of my peripheral vision. So I try to imagine myself standing in that room and then I say, are these things and pictures and images things that I can see if I were just like scanning around with my peripheral vision? And I think that keeps me from packing it too closely and just being able to have a more intuitive sense of, oh, this is what's in the room with me. And uh, if I could just add to that real quick, going back to kind of being able to generate a lot of palaces, that, I mean, that certainly is, I think, people's primary concern. They think, oh, I got, I got to pack things in because, you know, I'm going to run out of palaces and that's going to be it. And so, you know, one of the things that, like I mentioned, you know, we have we have a brainstorming, you know, Excel file where we kind of just write palace ideas into it. We have like a, a version of that that you can find on our website. I think it's in the uh, the Step Up video series. If you look, you know, if you can find that on our website, there's a, there's an Excel doc that you can download, which just basically is a, is a template that you can kind of fill out, you know, it gives you ideas for, you know, using residences or, you know, schools that you've been to or, you know, movie theaters, different places in town, stuff like that. And so it kind of helps you generate ideas. And if you just sit down and spend, you know, 15, 20 minutes on that, you know, I think you, you'd be surprised to see how many places you can think of that you could possibly use as memory palaces. And, you know, we're always kind of adding to that list. You know, I have a little reminder on my calendar, you know, every week where I, you know, I sit down and I add places that I've been, uh, and we've been interviewing a lot all over the country. And so I've been constantly kind of adding new places. It's very easy to pick them up. You know, humans, like I said, are very, very good at that at just kind of naturally picking up spatial memory. I guess my, you know, just to kind of piggyback on what Kathy was saying, I think my primary tip would be to just start off, you know, hopefully you can keep that in mind and uh, just start off a little bit conservative and just try to be a little bit spacious with the way you space things out. You know, if you have a particular topic, you know, a subtopic like a type of drug, for instance, use one room for that drug. Don't try to put like 10 different drugs in a single room. Just kind of, you know, use a basic unit like a room or something like that to hold each little chunk of material. So try to just space it out as much as you can in the beginning. And then as you get more comfortable, you can try to be a little more condensed if if you'd like to be. Okay. That makes more sense. I know, especially for sentimental homes, I was always afraid to quote unquote waste them on certain material. Yeah. Yeah. My childhood home, I wanted to be, when I started learning this, I wanted that to be for medicine. So one room was going to be all of micro. One room was going to be all of... (laughs) Right, right. Quickly realized that was not going to work out very well. Since then, I 
been trying to do the same thing, trying to add lists of possible memory palaces just from places I visited, a, a local eatery, a hotel room on a vacation. Mm -hmm. And you yep. really can use pretty much anything as long as you, like you mentioned, use active recall within a certain amount of time so you don't let that begin to fade. Exactly. One palace, one thing that I think sometimes people forget is you. it doesn't even have to be a real place that you've been to. It just has to be a place that you know well. So Alex and I are big fans of the show The Office and we watch it a lot. And we know that space, you know, on this TV show where these people go into their office every day. I mean, I feel like I've been in that office myself, even though I haven't. And so that is a memory palace that I've used. Yeah, that's actually one that I use for memory competitions. I've also heard video games like Minecraft, people creating their own palaces. Yeah, yeah. Video games, definitely, definitely good. Like a lot of these things, you can be a little kind of creative with. And at least for me, there was kind of a tendency to think, oh, I, I need to make this as real, real true to life as possible. And you can really be kind of loosey goosey with it. You know, if like I have, a, you know, a space where I memorize things about like uh, leukemias and lymphomas and stuff like that. And basically I, it's, it's along this street kind of not too far from our house here. Um, and a lot of the things on that street, I just kind of made up as I was making the palace. Um, and it still works pretty well. So, you know, it's, 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 it's not like it has to be someplace, you know, perfectly well. Um, you can be a little bit more, uh, you know, kind of flexible with it. Okay, great. For some advanced techniques that I've heard about for other topics, like probably PAO would be the one that's most commonly used now for numbers. What types of more advanced techniques would you recommend for specifically medicine? In terms of medicine, I personally wouldn't really recommend creating a, a number system just for the just for the average learner. What I would do is you can use basically a simple one digit system to remember specific numbers if you'd like. So you could use kind of basic, you know, just 10 images to remember individual digits if, if you want to. But apart from that, what I would do is just go with kind of the first image you think of. The other day, someone came to me with the image, it was 2550. To me, I just sort of broke that down into 25 and then 50. So you, I, I did basically just my image for it was just a step. So you just go from 25 to 50, you just kind of step up. And then once you kind of do a little bit of space retrieval practice on that, it should stick pretty well. And I think, you know, that general rule of just using space retrieval practice generally works well for numbers. Just so pick that's, the first thing that comes yeah, to mind. Yeah, just kind of pick the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, we actually literally, our most recent blog post is about this. A lot of times people look at what Alex is, has done, you know, memorize like thousands of numbers and they're like, oh, like this could be really useful for medicine. And like the thing is, uh, Alex spent a lot of time creating a three digit system, which honestly, and maintaining, and it, maintaining yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, which is like not, it was kind of a waste of time for a medical learner, I think, you know, like I'm sure it's been helpful for him, but that's because he was also using it for memory competitions. And so there was like more incentive to do it. Um, so I recently wrote a blog post kind of writing about how, you know, I memorize random strings of letters, random strings of numbers, not as a memory competitor, just, you know, the quick, basically the first thing that pops in my mind is usually what I go with. So when you just said 25, 50, I actually thought of a swimming pool because that's how I think about the pool is, you know, 25 meters down, 50 meters back. So I, in that case, I probably would have just memorized a pool and then just, you know, space repetition and then just remembered it that way. Or like for, for a quick example, I can't remember if this was on the, I don't think this was part of your uh, blog post or not, but like as an example, you know, if you wanted to memorize the gene like DQ2, which is associated with celiac disease, you could just, you know, DQ just kind of makes me think of Dairy Queen. And so maybe you just imagine you got an ice cream cone in each hand um, and you're just sort of licking them and that's kind of representing DQ too. So just kind of the first thing, you know, that kind of comes to mind in terms of, you know, that kind of number letter combination. I'd agree that creating and learning a whole number system would probably be a waste of time for most medical students. It is a bit time consuming and practicing them. But what I was thinking about is uh, I haven't specifically read anything yet for more advanced visual marker creation techniques, I should say, possibly something as simple as you have your basic marker and then you add something to it later on as new information comes to light or new important topics are added to your knowledge base. Do you have any specific thoughts or processes for anything like that? You know, well, well, the things that the thing that comes to mind for me, and hopefully I'm interpreting your question right, is you know this is one of the kind of benefits of doing this sort of process of creating palaces as you go. You know, so sort of the you know not kind of a priori creating palaces, but doing it as you're learning the material. I think this is helpful because when you do that and you don't have predetermined loci, what you can do is after the fact just come back to that same room. You know, let's just say I'm using my childhood bedroom to remember stuff about Staph aureus. If I come back and I learn something new about Staph aureus, I can just pick a new location, a little spot in that room that I haven't used already and just add a new image, you know, for Staph aureus in that room. And so it's still very nicely contained 
in that staff aureus space in my mind. That's kind of what I do is I'll just pick a new location in a, in the place that I've already you know used for that information. Yeah, I think what Alex is trying to say is like we don't use a very regimented like methodology for saying like the first thing I'm going to lay down is the name of it. The second thing I'm going to lay down is the shape of it or something. We don't do that. At least I don't do that because I'm just trying to remove all the barriers for myself or like kind of getting the information in my head um, just to kind of think of the first thing I think of and then just laying it down and then kind of moving on. One thing I have done in a more like regimented categorical way is sometimes I'll use categories to remember things. So like everything that's like steroid related, you know, I'll use like a character from some show or, you know, from some book that I like. I used to do that. I use that less now, but initially it was a little bit helpful in just being able to understand like categories of things a little more quickly, I guess. Yeah. I've been finding that everyone has very different ways in adding new materials. So some people will chunk material by rooms. Some people will use the room as a general location for their memory palace, but then each visual marker is being chunked. So they'll actually add a new object or change the color or texture to that original object to signify a different type of category. So it's really interesting to see the variety of ways that you can alter and add to previously created visual markers and memory palaces. I think that kind of goes back to like my own personal preference for not creating any images or putting images anywhere that I can't get a sense of it through my peripheral vision. I think that's just my personal preference. I don't want to encode too much like meta information in an image itself. Yeah, generally we try to, and Kathy says this a lot, we try to avoid using images that are sort of self-referential so that like you kind of have to use the image itself to get the information. That's just because that kind of, yeah, it's, it seems like you're kind of losing the, the value of the memory technique. I personally, I try to avoid kind of doing things like, you know, just like changing the color or something like that. Um, I'll usually just try to pick something similar that is still kind of visually different um, than the original image. Because, you know, at least personally, I found that you know, if you just kind of change subtle things, uh, you end up kind of forgetting, uh, you know, the differences very well. Because it requires a little bit of brute force memory to remember, like if something is written on something or it's changed to color, you know, actionable things like something falling off, something shattering, something burning. I, I can see that out of my peripheral vision and, and that's what I tend to go with. Right. And so, you know, as a, a, a quick example, and this kind of goes back to what Kathy was saying about categories, you know, if I have an image for something and, and let's say my image is a dog, you know, and I have another similar image that's related to that, instead of like, you know, making a blue dog instead of a red dog, I'll just use a cat maybe, you know, just as a simple example. Um, and then you can kind of differentiate dog and cat um, a little bit better, you know, you know, for instance, the cat could be scratching things or stuff like that better than you would if you just had sort of a blue and a red dog, if that makes sense. Okay. I actually made exactly that. I, I'm not sure yet if it's going to be a mistake because I had to try to make some of the uh, visual markers after I had already finished the class, but trying to use an animal-based <laughs> mnemonic and changing the color for different alpha hemolytic, beta hemolytic, gamma hemolytic, and micro. And I'm not sure that that's really working out too well for me right now. So that probably brings up a very good point uh, of a possible barrier to avoid later on. Right. Or, or, you know, and this is, this is just kind of coming from our personal experience, you know, like instead of, you know, as an, as a suggestion, maybe instead of, um, instead of, you know, using something that, you know, has a blue color and then something that has a red color, if you wanted to kind of go a route similar to that, you could maybe use more of like an icy theme for the, for the sort of blue color, and then maybe a very hot theme for the, for the red color. So that kind of adds a little bit of extra kind of semantic meaning rather than just two different colors. Environmental difference. That's cool. I like that. As far as possibly training new students in these techniques, I know you already mentioned walking with Einstein from Joshua Fower. Another one that you mentioned in our previous communications that I also found very, very useful was quantum memory from Dominic O'Brien. Would you say those are maybe two good resources for anyone to start off with, no matter your level? You know, it just kind of depends on what your goals are. I think certainly, you know, I, I don't know that I would necessarily recommend those books to everyone. I mean, I think they're great books. I think if you want to, you know, read Moonwalking with Einstein, it's a great read. I don't think that everyone necessarily needs to read that to kind of get a sense of, you know, basic sense of memory techniques. You know, what would you think of as kind of a basic introduction? Well, honestly, I think our website is. That's, That's what know, we that tried to do. Huge, yeah. I mean, that was like the huge um, reason we started it is because 
we felt like there here were these powerful techniques that were still not very well described or prescribed for people who wanted to specifically use it for advanced learning. So that was like, you know, we did it because we kind of felt like, well, you know, somebody should write about this, I guess we'll do it. Right. I mean, it, and we really wanted to try to provide a lot of concrete examples of using these things because it's, it's really easy to find, you know, memory palace tutorials out there. How to memorize you know, grocery lists. Yeah. Or just, you know, how to memorize kind of a standard list of things. But then people sort of just say, okay, well, now use this to, to learn. Learn medicine. And then there's, there's definitely kind of a black <laughs> so box when it, when it comes to, yeah, like actually using that technique, but using it in an effective way for, for medicine, which is very complicated. Um, so we kind of wanted to provide some concrete examples on our website yeah. to do that. I would say as a general learning tip, I think that um, there's a website and there's also a podcast associated with it called yeah. The Learning Scientists, which is very good. So it's it's a couple of researchers who, um, who are involved in actual cognitive psychology research related to education and learning. So I think it's, um, so that's a good one for people to check out. I think, you know, I, I like to listen to their podcast. So, so that's, that's, I think definitely a good one in terms of recommending, you know, general learning strategies for everyone. Uh, I, I think our, our website is a good place, I would say. Yeah. So those are kind of two main ones, I would think. If you want to just kind of play around with, you know, number systems or let's say learning people's uh, names and things like that, certainly, you know, those books that you mentioned, you know, uh, Moonwalking with Einstein and Quantum Memory Power by Dominic O'Brien are really good. Yeah, those are those are good places to start for sure. And you definitely have some great blog posts, frequently asked questions, videos on your site as well, all of which we will link in the show notes for the audience. So I like to end the show with what I call a walk down memory lane, just three rapid fire sort of questions go in as little or as much depth as you want. Question one being, is there anything that you wish you could remember better? Ooh. What a great question. Especially for a memory champion. You know, I would say that I'm still not very good with people's names, which kind of bugs me. <laughs> um, I, I've gotten pretty good at memorizing competition names, which actually are very different from, from regular names because, you know, you basically have a bunch of people's mugshots and their names on a page. And so I've gotten used to kind of finding little uh, markers on people's faces on mugshots to link images to. It's a little bit more challenging in real life. I, I would say I've gotten better at it over time, but certainly one of the things that helped me remember names, and this probably seems like overkill to some people, I'll jot down people's names, you know, people that I've met, and I'll actually put them into my Anki cards. So you know, I will, I will literally have people's names kind of pop up on my Anki and I'll think, or it'll say like, you know, person you met at blank place or something like this. And I'll try to, you know, do space you know, or do retrieval practice on that, uh, on that name. Um, and that kind of definitely helps me improve my long-term memory for names. Might be a little bit overkill, but, but that's something that I do now. Um, mm -hmm. Still working on my name, my name uh, memory. For me, one thing I've been thinking about a lot recently is, you know, I read these really cool scientific articles, you know, and I can't remember who wrote it. And that's like a really useful way to reference something, you know, like, you know, so-and-so's paper in 2011, like said this, and I'll just remember the paper, I'll just remember the title, because that's much more like semantic, meaningful to me, and I remember what was in it. But I would love to really, you know, sit down by myself and kind of think of a strategy to remember it better, because I think that would just make my life easier. That's a great point. You can't really reference an article if you can't remember who wrote it or yeah. find it again for them to have the correct information for them to go out and find it. Okay. The second question is looking back now, is there anything you would have changed about how you approach medical school? Yeah. I mean, I would certainly say that, you know, one of the things that I wish we would have done is, is kind of figured out this whole memory technique thing earlier. You know, we, we did it the way we did it. You know, it, you can't really go back and change it. It took, well, we it took us some time. On ourselves yeah, it took bit. us some time to kind of figure things out. Um, but it would have been great to kind of have a good strategy, you know, going going in right from the beginning of medical school um, and kind of being able to really have all of those kind of original, you know, anatomy and biochem kind of concepts more locked down over time. Um, so that would have been super helpful. My, my other main one is that I think the big thing when it comes to exams like step one or step two, I think that obviously all these things, memory techniques or, you know, space retrieval practice, all these are super helpful for that. But really the, the primary thing that's going to, that's going to help you on, on those exams is going to be practice questions. And so doing actual vignette style question bank questions from things like UWorld or Kaplan or USMLE RX. I wish I had devoted more time to those earlier on in, in my med career. And then certainly, you know, devoted a higher proportion of my time to those going into the exams. So I think that, that would be, I guess that's two things, but that those would be mine. For me, I would say, you know, coming from an engineering background and just being like a person of this modern world, I definitely had this prejudice against memorization from the beginning, which seems hilarious now. I think memorization gets a real stigma. 
sometimes, you know, people say, if you understand it, you don't have to memorize it. You know, memorization is just like brute force. It's like the, the most basis of ways to learn something. But like my response to that is like, you do need to have sufficient, you know, surface foundational knowledge to really appreciate the richness of the concepts you're learning, you know? So there definitely is a time and place for it. And I think like to have a real prejudice or aversion to it really does yourself a disservice when you're trying to learn something as complex as medicine and really understand the concepts on a deeper level. Yes. We want to teach them to learn, not teach them to memorize while well, they've never been to medical school. <laughs> <laughs> I do think that you bring up an excellent point about developing specific techniques for medicine as well. And I hope that maybe through this podcast and through collaborations with organizations such as yours, we can develop a community specifically for that. And if you get a chance in the audience as well, please join our Facebook group at Medical Nemonist Mastermind. And hopefully we can collaborate on different techniques specifically for medicine in the future. And then the last question I have for you, is there anything you wish you did differently in your career or side gig so far? I mean, this is, kind of, this is kind of a dumb one, but, but with, with Mullen Memory, I think that we probably could do a better job of actually promoting it. <laughs> so, so Mullen Memory is technically, is, it's a nonprofit, it's a website, and we, it's very much kind of a side thing for us. You know, we, we work on it when we have time, when we kind of feel, feel the, the, the inspiration, but like we don't put a whole lot of effort into it. We, we don't have any like kind of monetary, yeah. we don't have any monetary kind of involvement with it. We, we don't put a whole lot of necessarily, a, a whole lot of time into, you know, marketing things or sending out very regular email updates or regular like social media posts. We probably could do a better job of that. So, you know, that's something that I would change if I had to pick pick something in terms of a side gig. I guess so. But at the same time, like making it too serious for us raises kind of the barrier, the obstacle, like the mental obstacle. Like, yeah, oh my gosh, we have to true. do it. It's just something fun that we like to do. So yeah. I don't think I have any real regrets. Life has been very serendipitous for us. You know, we just kind of do things and it's been fun and we've been glad that we get to do the things we get to do. So it sounds like it's been a very interesting life and pathway so far through medicine. And I hope the both of you the best in your future. Are there any parting words for the audience? Yeah, I mean, I would just say, you know, I, I think that, you know, don't don't be scared to kind of try something out like this. It's, it's definitely something that afflicts medical students. There's this kind of, you know, Psych psychological concept called the tyranny of success, which we which we kind of have come across a lot, which basically means that people who have had success throughout their life are are that much more resistant to, to changing their habits. And so certainly this applies to medical learners. You know, you come into medicine, you've done well in high school, you've done well in college, you've gotten into medical school, you think you know what you're doing. Um, and then a lot of you know people, including us, yeah. um, you find that you're not really ready. For, you're not really ready for medicine. You don't have the right tools um, or the right strategies to tackle it properly. Um, and so, you know, try to resist that tyranny of success and really kind of go after something new and be, be, be okay with kind of experimenting a little bit, you know, be kind of like we've said, be kind of careful about your use of memory techniques and try to be selective about it. But certainly, you know, trying new things, you know, trying to apply spaced retrieval practice and, and things like this are, are certainly good ways to really kind of boost your learning and, and, and feel free to experiment with it. Yeah, you don't have to use it for everything. Alex Mullen and Kathy Chen, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thanks for having Thanks us, for having Chase. Us, Chase.